I've never taken part in politics as such, as a role. Um, I've always wanted to believe in a government that is not perfect, but at least at least tries its best for the people. And um, obviously, we've always been interested in what's going on, current affairs, and, and very critical, of course. But so it's, it's really been a series of events that have led to losing trust in the government that has brought me here today. Um, growing up, we had racism in the 80s. Um, in that time, we just kind of lived with it. There wasn't really much that could be done to help. But I do remember that um, certain words were at the end of kind of that uh, beginning of era were classified as racist. So, th you know, that was kind of a solution that we got out of it. Um, later on, there was the first Gulf War of 1991. Uh, that was a very gloomy period. Of, um, but even then, it was kind of, you know, the authorities must know what they're doing. Um, type of memory that I have from that time. And then we had 9-11, we had the attack on Afghanistan. The media was really against Muslims um, during all of that time, obviously. And, you know, even in movies, you'd see the Muslims as being the bad guy. Um, occasionally, you'd, you'd have kind of like false flag operations shown in movies. And that would be quite interesting, you know, to show the other side of, of the story. Then we had uh, the Iraq, the second Iraq war, um, and that happened despite million man marches across the world. And it was, obviously, we found out later how unjust it was on the civilians. I mean, Julian Assange is, is still suffering the aftermath of whistleblowing and everything that happened there. And, you know, that's, I think, when the, the major doubt of authority began. Um, um, the There were many attacks on Gaza, on Lebanon by Israel, I think 2006, 2008 stand out to me. Um, at that time, mainstream media, obviously, even now, it doesn't really show the reality of what's going on. So, so social media had kind of become more common. And that's when we saw the images of how people were suffering. You would have parents sending photos of their children, much as, you know, the same as what's happening right now in Gaza. And that opened my eyes. I remember sharing it and although, you know, it was disturbing to many people, but it did help them realize that it isn't how it's depicted, that Israel is not a victim being bombarded by rockets and stones. They were actually, you know, doing the the aggression. But after that, there was no accountability. So that was, that was a major shock to me that now that the world can see what's happening, even still, there's no, there's no accountability. Um, I remember that many countries accepted Palestine as a state during that time. Um, and then the general climate of UK, where you'd have hit and miss of having good leaders. Um, you know, Jeremy Corbyn uh, created a huge following. There was, a you know, hundreds of thousands of people joined Labour. Um, and then the witch hunt happened on, you know, against him and his supporters. And then we left in droves as well. Um, then later there was the pandemic and, you know, maybe it was naive, but I expected there to be some kind of international or even national protocol <laughs> to manage the state of affairs. Um, I remember there was questionable science, you know, I was actually asking my friends that this doesn't sound right. You know, we did virology at class and that, that class stood out to me at university, sorry. Um, things didn't make sense. There was um, isolation social distancing, you know, people turning against each other, posting on next door Facebook pages that this person has walked, you know, too close to me in the park. And it was a bit daunting to leave the house to, for that one hour of exercise we were allowed. Um, despite all of that, the Conservative HQ Christmas party happened, you know, at the same time. I remember a story of a boy who died alone. His parents were not even allowed to be with him in his hospital room. And, you know... It kind of was uh, brought it to home that the governments are not governing. I don't know, you know, what their function is or their purpose, but they are not governing. And you know, there are many more heartbreaking attacks on Gaza before the one that's happening even now. And it just seems that the world is standing on one side, and the world leaders on another. You have demonstrations. You have student encampments. Two men have set themselves on fire. Um, it's difficult to just, you know, go about daily life knowing that this is still happening. 
Uh, still, the threshold of murder hasn't been reached for any condemnation of Israel by the governments. Our government doesn't see us, it doesn't hear us, only to condemn us for speaking out or, you know, demonstrating. Um, I've been lobbying MPs for the past few months. It's had no effect whatsoever. It's been very frustrating. And I've seen that these the same MPs, they have very little knowledge on the matter. I mean, they might not even have researched, they have, might not even seen the photos of the suffering that's happening there. Yet they have the power to vote and to decide on the lives of people that are not even in their own country without any knowledge, you know, without any understanding. So basically, I learned that we can't really influence politics from the outside. And as much as we can, we have to get involved in order to get the representation that we deserve. Uh, ethics and morality are completely thrown out currently. And it's really going to require normal people, not politicians, but normal people to inject all of these values back into the government. Time is quite short because of the snap election. So there's not much you know, time to look left or right and just focusing what I'm doing. Um, I'm really, uh, my focus is concerned with the message that I want to put out to the community. And I want that to have an effect that lasts longer than just the election. So um, I've been walking around leafleting, asking what the cons concerns are. Um, you know, while asking people to vote for me, I suddenly felt a really heavy burden of responsibility um, that, you know, the people that I'm talking to and everything in the constituency falls under an MP. And you don't have to imagine too deeply about the problems that they might be having. And you can see on their faces that they're struggling. And I mean, there's poverty, mental health issues, unlivable conditions, unemployment. Each person I walk past has burdens that they're living with. And I was just wondering that how much do our MPs actually think about these things? So, you know, I... I started speaking more, I mean, I'm leafleting, but at the same time talking to members of the community, be they people at the doorstep, walking past them in the street or shopkeepers, uh, business people. And a, a lot of the cases, the feeling is that the MPs don't care about them, that they don't even know that they exist. Um, I've been to different areas of the constituency and there's a stark contrast, you know, border to border. The affluent areas are happy but they're concerned with disruption due to development issues that are occurring um, and, you know, isolation and, and uh, it's a different set of issues which are understandable, they need support in. And then the other areas of concerns are really different. You have, I had one gentleman describe that it's difficult to meet rent rises with low wages and, I, you know, to apply for a council house was too complicated. And I said to him, you know, we were standing next to the council building and I just said, you know, there's the council building, just go there tomorrow when you know, during office hours and they'll help you. And he said he'll see, but he doesn't think that they care. He just said the government doesn't care. Um, you know, I've, I've spoken to shopkeepers. They said they're disappointed with both the council and the police. Um, there's a there's a council estate that I visited. They asked for the for CCTV cameras to be put up by the police so that it could prevent crime and you know, antisocial behaviour. And the police didn't help with that either. So they just say it's a waste of time. Um, there was one story of a mother who has many issues such as disability and being evicted from her home. And when I asked, you know, what's your main concern? And she said, Gaza is my main concern. So, you know, I'm, I'm preparing these stories for my website. It's available for people to read. And if anyone can come forward to help, then, you know, it's, the information is out there. I've left the um, contact um, area on, on the website. But Labour in my constituency manifested in abstaining from the November ceasefire vote, as well as for suspension of arms, export licenses to Israel, accountability for war crimes, Labour filibustered the February ceasefire debate in Parliament and forced a reduced version of the SNP motion for ceasefire. And now, if I put it politely, are attempting to advertise this negative into a positive light that we did vote for ceasefire. So, you know, there's an attempt at confusion going on. They're avoiding hustings as well, but they are canvassing. We expect the shadow Parliament to 
to criticize the government when they're wrong, but they supported the government. And if they can do that in when there's, there are crimes against humanity happening, then what hope do we have that they're going to be caring and considerate of us as the government when they're in power? So it's quite a fearful time that you know we do uh, expect them to come into power, but I don't know what's going to happen. It it's just feels like they will be worse than conservatives. I grew up in and around the constituency. Um, my son was born in West Middlesex Hospital. My sister went to the Heathen School. You know, my kids played in Sion Parks. There's a Snakes and Ladders um, there, which um, Children's Park. We used to buy Samurai Warrior Fish at Sion Park Pet Shop when we were younger. Regular food shopping all the time. I've got, I have memories all over the borough, so it, it's, it's home. Um, I recently worked there to um, on a project to support the elderly during the end of the pandemic. Um, I also did community work and we had a food bank for a short while. Um, the best part of the area is just for me, having history there, uh, knowing the friendly and welcoming community. It's a, it's a lovely, beautiful, uh, quiet place uh, as well. In, in some, I mean, the affluent areas are lovely. And I feel really protective over the neglected areas of the town. And, you know, I read negative comments online about it. And I it, I just don't enjoy them at all because it's they're, they're areas which are densely populated and they are deprived. And I remember that like ever since I can remember, it's been that way. So it isn't the fault of the residents. It's, you know, the council should be taking care of things and maintaining equally across the constituency. I think there's, the challenges are probably the same as all, of, all across the country. The cost of living, um, you know, the cost of living is such a commonplace term now. What does it mean? It means paying to live. Um, you know, austerity, austerity has caused apparently 335,000 deaths between 2012 and 2019. People are struggling and hanging by a thread. There are food banks, you know, people have to decide whether to turn the heating on or not during winter. Uh, the wages are low. It's hard to get a job. Food prices are up. Energy bills, rent. Um, you know, the NHS is also struggling. West Middlesex Hospital is a good hospital, but obviously there are there are problems that people have had in in all hospitals. Uh, GP waiting lists. Um, you know, most of us would avoid A and E due to the waiting times there. There are mental health crises. Uh, you know in all ages of the community, there isn't enough support for the youth, which is leading to a rise in crime and not enough policing. And all of this is connected. And, you know, we wonder what the government is thinking. And, uh, you know, perhaps the government isn't thinking for 14 years, it hasn't really cared about the normal average person. It's a quite depressing state of affairs. Yes, because I, I do have a fear of the NHS. They haven't, Labour hasn't mentioned that it will be um, reversing privatisation. And that is a, 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 you know, in my personal experience recently, my mother had a heart attack and during the actual emergency time period, they were very good. It was very quick. And since then, we've been lost in the system. We don't know, you know, who to turn to, who to talk to. We have a lot of long list of numbers, but whoever we turn to kind of send us somewhere else. And she's been back in a &E, I think, at least five times in the last three months due to angina pains. Um, it's, I mean, partly because the, I think it's the intersector communication is lacking because the staff are hired by agencies and because of the extra costs of the agencies, it, they, you know, have less staff. So I might, you know, my mother had an MRI done in one hospital, but it will not be passed on to the next one in, even as an urgent you know, situation, it might take a few weeks. So it was, it was quite a, a shock to go through that for even a heart, something as serious as a heart condition. It, it's not, you know, it's quite frightening. So yeah, the NHS is something uh, which I thought would be a priority for labor. But they are going to hire more staff, but I don't know what the rest of the issues. 
how they'll man manage those. I, I'm very interested in, in connecting all the issues together. So um, the first step to connect them into manageable solutions would be to have community engagement with the government and to establish that through regular citizens' assemblies. So any issues that need to be raised by the community can be brought there by representatives of the community and they can discuss, um, you know, learn about what can be done discuss and then have decisions that come out of that and present them to the government through the MP. So I think that would be very ne much necessary because the kind of disenchantment that's happening, the uh, disenfranchisement of the you know community, that could be reversed by involving them regularly in these sessions. Um, I also believe that the youth engagement is very important. Um, you know, some towns have youth clubs and they work really hard to provide sessions for the children and teenagers and uh, they, they benefit them and, and they're also free of cost. But then other towns, they don't have anything for the youth and then that's where you find antisocial behaviour and crime prevalent. Um, jobs are also hard to secure. So, um, I, you know, a good idea would, have, would be to have children in sixth form to have uh, real life training as well as you know at the end of the study period maybe in the summer have the time to have training so that when they leave school and they apply for jobs they have that little bit of experience which is required uh, which otherwise they cannot obviously have so public interaction admin work perhaps there can be businesses who invite them for training um, age appropriate uh, work there um, and the most important thing is to prevent the students from starting out life in debt is to get rid of tuition fees, which were introduced by Labour in 1998. To end the Israeli state's destruction of Gaza, first of all, right now would be to actually ask for an end to the, the destruction, to demand Israel to stop and to pressurise them in every way until they stop. So UK hasn't done this. So that, that I think would be the first step. Um, you know, the very vocal world leaders have insisted on Israel's right to defend itself. Despite this being against the clear statement of the ICJ in 2004 that, and I quote, Israel does not have the right to self-defense in relation to attacks that emanate from within an occupied ter territory that it controls. And also in a 1974 resolution, UN resolution, it also asserted to reaffirm the legitimacy of self-determination, including armed struggle against colonial subjugation. So uh, that's quite clear cut. And um, I believe that eight months ago, what should have been done is, you know, what is the logical and historical thing to do if one set of people launch a massive physical military attack on another? The solution to that is to, well, you know, to prevent that is to defend them from the attack with military support. And that's what they're doing for Ukraine. And they're doing that for Israel as well, who is the aggressor in the situation. And as far as military action is concerned, the UN Charter Article 45 orders members, member states to hold national air force contingents for combined international enforcement action. So at any moment, the UN can back up their demands with the enforcement power of an air force. And, you know, I was wondering, why doesn't this happen? It doesn't happen because a united decision between the P5 member states is required, which will never be reached. So that's another thing that should be abolished. The UN should enable a combined action to remove the P5 veto power of US, UK, France, China and Russia. That would allow democratic decision making. It would keep out any illegal activity, you know, keep that at bay, allow for justice, accountability, and peace that doesn't end all peace. So, you know, rather than issuing resolutions that no one listens to, they need to actually back it up with a framework that can enforce these resolutions. For 75 years, there's been an oppression and violence against the Palestinians. And there, you know, there are over 8,000 Palestinians captured by Israel today, including young children. And it's this and the advancement of illegal settlements that have caused any per periodic uprising that's been happening. 
So the solution there is to stop the expansion and of the settlements and to return the captives. Uh, there should have been ongoing sanctions on the government of Israel, the first time that it broke international law. This would have prevented the predatory mindset that we see today and the excess of weapons that are being experimented with there. Um, time and again, Israel has broken ceasefire or attacked embassies or foreign countries. Even the free, free, uh, Freedom Flitter, I think, in 2002, um, where volunteers were killed and they were blamed by them, even by the media. But Israel has never even had a slap on the wrist. And then if we go back 75 years, so what does the law say when you're given a gift that returns out to be stolen goods? You have to give it back. You know, there needs to be a real support for political solution, which takes uh, into proper account what the Palestinians want in their path to self-determination, you know, as well as what Israel wants. Um, there has to be a fair management through this, through the transition, transition stage until everything is established and running smoothly and there's no longer any threat there. So there's a lot of hard work that to be done that should have been done. And then for UK as well, there's, you know, the, the government uses propaganda, social division, um, and even uh, sometimes false flag operations to garner support for colonialism and the interference in governments abroad. And all of this has to stop. Uh, yes, um, I believe this is very important to local people. I mean, I've I've seen people of all ethnic backgrounds, you know, all demographics, all um, wealthy, not wealthy, and they have said that this is a very important issue to them. One, you know, one family said that we've been lifelong Labour supporters, but this time we will not be voting for Labour purely because of this, because of the lack of humanity. So that was that was quite shocking to to, to me, and you know, it, it's also uh, you feel that humanity stands in the people. You know, we are we are all the same. We we care about life and death. If you see images of children dying, and the government doesn't care about that, then you know you think that you do have the wrong government up there in power. There are lots of disenchanted voters looking for who to vote for, ready to even just spoil their vote this time. And in fact, some might not even want to vote, which is the, the wrong kind of uh, path to take. But I understand how you all feel because I feel the same. I was a Labour Party member until I saw it stand for betrayal and dishonour. And But unfortunately, the original Labour Party that we were supporting doesn't exist and, you know, the soul has been taken out of the body and replaced. So not in a poltergeist sense of position, possession, but, you know, the left wing socialist thinkers of the community still exist and have a lot of fight left in them. So I would advise to look in your areas to see who's standing. And even as a protest, vote for the candidate who speaks about morals and ethics. And, you know, all of the new candidates are united under humanity. When we protested, there was no religion, ethnicity, background. We were all humans demanding other humans to be protected. And I feel that anyone who is standing in the name of justice in Palestine, which is a nation so far away that it doesn't directly affect us in any way, you know, they will be the first to take care of the law and social progress here in the UK. And, you know, and then after the elections are over, that's when the real ongoing work begins. So after the elections, we um, have to continue to, you know, strive to get the community involved in politics, to get people from across the generations, you know, uh, the elders, our age, the young youngsters. We have to, you know, continue to feed them hope that there, it, this is in your control. You can make a change, and but it has to be by commitment and by constantly being involved and and questioning and asking questions, you know, and speaking up. So, I mean, we will have a plan of action. We'll, we'll see how things turn out and adapt the plan according to that. This is a grassroots level um, effort, and this is where it all starts. 
you know, when things get so bad and you imagine that they cannot get worse, they still can get worse and they often do, as we've seen in the, in the attacks on Gaza as well. And to prevent it from getting even worse in the UK, we need to start working in a different way. Politicians are elected to serve us, not the other way around. Um, a while ago, someone mentioned to me that the idea that we have to vote for one of the two major parties, otherwise our vote is wasted, that this is brainwashing. And I didn't really realize how much this is true. When I spoke to some people in the area, um, I, I mean, a shopkeeper that I met said that, said that he, he feels that Labour will win this time, so he has to vote for them, otherwise his vote will be wasted. And, you know, it, it's like betting on a horse, but you're not getting anything out of it either. But you have to, you have to, it's, I don't know, he just thought that it has to be the winner that he votes for, whether they're good for him or not. And we've forgotten that our vote is our voice. And the only way it's wasted is if we don't use it for a candidate that, who represents what we stand for. So at times, strategic voting is a useful tool, but this is not one of those times. Um, the main difference between myself and others are that I'm an independent, uh, not part of any party, free from party whip, able to act with conscience for the community's needs. Um, independents all over the country, aligned with my thinking, are offering an alternative to the age-old negative politics that has destroyed the foundation of the society. And we're reminding everyone of the common themes of humanity, equality, service, community, family, and offering to make these within your reach as part of a support system that oversees as it governs. And, you know, rather than kind of like an alien autocracy, you know, disguised as democracy. But the caveat is that it will take hard work and not giving up, and it has to be done together. And anything can be achieved faster with large numbers. So um, to say, I'd like to say to the voters, whether in the constituency or around the country, that whatever has happened in Gaza and the decline in this country it didn't happen overnight. And, you know, there was a wave across the world of leaders who made it acceptable to remove their mask and show the dark side of human nature to be the norm. And this has partly come from our complacency. The Gaza genocide has shocked us out of this, or out of this, and but even still, there you know, there it feels like there are no limits left unbroken, and only new records set of set for horror. Um, most of us have a revived conscience now, and we will be able to work towards bringing us back to where we should be as human beings. This will not happen by waiting for someone else to do it. We all have to get up and do it. And like the saying goes that, you know, what can one person do, said the majority of the 67 million like-minded people of the UK. So it, it will happen if we start and doing things together and spreading the message and not giving up.